Welcome to today's panel discussion on global regulatory priorities. Do they correlate? Insurance is vital to economic growth and resiliency. And insurance regulation can have a profound impact on how well the insurance sector serves its markets. Today's panel will explore three key global insurance regulatory priorities, ESG, financial inclusion, and cyber. These are global regulatory issues, and we have an esteemed panel of global regulators to address them. We're joined today by Petra Hilkema, the chairperson of EOPA, Dean Cameron, the president of the NAIC and the director of insurance in Idaho, and Simon Lam Suikong, the executive director of general business for the Insurance Authority of Hong Kong. And to moderate this all-star panel, we have another star, Andrea Keenan, who is EVP, Chief Strategy Officer for AM Best Rating Services. The speaker's bios are included in the conference materials, and so I will not recite those here. But I do want to note that with the participation of Petra, Dean, and Simon, we have representatives from the two largest insurance markets in the world and one of the leading regulatory jurisdictions in Asia, Hong Kong. These three regulators have deep regulatory expertise, and they understand the importance of clear, proportionate, balanced regulation, which balances the often competing regulatory goals of solvency regulation, consumer protection, and market development. These are, these are critically important qualities in dealing with the pressing regulatory issues of today. On behalf of the IAS, I want to welcome Petra, Dean, and Simon to today's panel discussion. Andrea, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Keenan, and I'm EVP and CSO of AM Best Rating Services. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel of esteemed industry experts who carry great responsibility on guidance of their respective jurisdictions through what is an ever-changing landscape. While each of the panelists has extensive backgrounds in the industry and beyond, they each are in the midst of very different policy, political, and social environments and must navigate them accordingly. And so we're representing Europe, the US, and Hong Kong here through Petra, Dean, and Simon, um, who were introduced by Bill Marcoux. Thank you, Bill. And I think since we have that introduction, we can head straight into some questions that are going to be on the subjects of items that are really uh, crucial in uh, today's insurance industry, such as ESG and inclusion and cyber insurance. And it's very interesting to see where we stand on the point of regulation and what regulation can do to both handle the pressures from the industry and from the various constituents within the government and with, within the citizens of the various um, countries and regions, and also how to really uh, foster a very positive um, and flourishing industry and insurance environment. So with that, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And ESG as a topic has been front of mind in Europe for many years and in some jurisdictions, significantly less so, but it's rising. And I'll mention at AM Best, where we have a global presence, we find quite a range of perceptions of insurers across geographies. So um, given that, at least in my perception, Europe is in the lead, uh, Petra, could you perhaps comment on um, your point of view as far as where ESG at this, um, where ESG is and what IOPA's latest initiatives are. Yes, um, thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for having me uh, here on this uh, excellent panel. I uh, look forward to the discussion. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, ESG, uh, very important topic indeed for, for many years already on the agenda. And if you ask me where we are today, I think one of the important steps we are taking is that we are really moving from maybe to a certain extent thinking that we we can assess the risk and then prevent it 
from accepting that some risks are there, that, that there will be change and that we will need to deal with the change, uh, either by actually dealing with the new risks or by mitigating the risk in such a way that they won't be as large as we expect them today um, or see them being today, uh, particularly when it comes to climate risk. And what we've always said, and I, I strongly feel that that is the case, is that insurers, reinsurers, and also pension funds will have a, a key role to play here. Um, first of all, themselves, they integrate uh, these risks uh, uh, in, in their risk management already, but they should keep doing that. And, and, and with all the developing insights, uh, continue to include, <coughs> sorry, these risks <coughs> and how they work uh, going forward in their, in their overall management, that's one. But second, they can also be part of the transition that society has to go through. First of all, on the investment side, and where we definitely have to prevent greenwashing, but where good things can be done as long. And I think that this is key, that we accept that there will be time needed to transition. And in times of transition, there will be a mix of, of, of green investments and other investments in order to, in the end, make the full transition. I think that is something to be recognized. Um, and secondly, of course, there is on the on the on the su supply side, on, on the side where they sell the products, what products do they sell? Can they prevent protection gaps? But also can they encourage consumers and businesses to, to adapt in order to mitigate risks? I think this is the overall thinking. And where that brings us in practice is, is many different lines of, of, of work uh, when it comes to data collection. Uh, and we need good data, we need reliable data, good quality data, preferably comparable data. Um, uh, we, we have standards are coming up, new regulations are coming on the SFDR, the taxonomy, I think are good steps. Uh, when you look at the regulatory frame of prudential risk um, in the solvency to review, this is being included now in the legal framework uh, through uh, a reassessment every two years of the NETCAT, the Natural Catastrophe Risk Module, but also to make, again, an assessment of the need to have risk differentials in capital requirements. Now, I strongly feel that capital requirements are no substitute for carbon taxes. At carbon taxes are for the political level. But I do think that it is good that have a, to have an evidence-based, data-driven analysis of the actual risks. And if we would find um, the risks to be such that it would be appropriate to change uh, uh, capital requirements in relation to climate risk, we could. We've done this analysis in the past, then we've concluded it would not be appropriate, but maybe going forward we would. Uh, I think it's good to do the assessment. Finally, we of course do forward-looking stress testing. Uh, we've done sensitivity analysis on transition risk and climate change risk. And we will also do more stress testing going forward, including this year, the climate stress test for pension funds. So all in all, that's what we do on climate, but of course it doesn't stop there. Biodiversity is getting more and more relevant as are other social risks of the ESG. And also here we develop, we will develop further, but this is where we are. And while we are there, what we do is we, we, we are very active in the, in the global discussion in the IAS, in the ISSB, um, uh, we try to, to contribute as, uh, to the extent possible. And I think what is important here is that um, uh, we have an opportunity to, uh, to be uh, as harmonized as we can from the start. It won't be fully harmonized, but we, we could make efforts to be as harmonized as we can. We could also make efforts to learn from each other. There are different parts of the world that have unfortunately a lot of experience with different kinds of natural catastrophe risks. So I think we can learn from each other, but we can also help each other moving forward. I think the key topic here will be data. Again, um, quality, comparability, reliability, and, and assurance at a global level will be key to prevent greenwashing, to make the right assessments, etc. Um, so I'm very happy the ISSB is working on this. I'm also very happy that the IIS is looking at its work, reassessing what is needed. And finally, I'm very happy with some of the bilateral dialogues we have focusing on sustainability, including a very good dialogue we currently have with uh, um, uh, Dean and his colleagues uh, uh, in the US. And I'll stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Petra. That's a uh... Um, very ambitious, and I love that you immediately, uh, or you ended with a comment towards Dean. <laughs> so, um, actually, Dean, uh, this is your opportunity to uh, perhaps respond to the, the, the bilateral relationship that's going on between um, Europe and the United States and where the NEIC stands on, the, on this particular topic. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And it's it's my pleasure to be able to to be with you. We have an we have, I have a great respect uh, for Petra and we have um, uh, an open dialogue. We may not see everything eye to eye, but that's that's how you collaborate and work through issues is when where you can uh, uh, you know share ideas and thoughts. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the title of this overall um, panel, uh, where it's it's discussing do do they correlate? Because I think the important component for the U.S. and the NAIC in particular is: are the approaches will they actually benefit or actually help solve the climate issues that we're facing? It's, it's really, uh, as an industry, at times we seem to be fighting a battle that is a, f a few years ago. Um, and I'm not saying that, that that's the case here in climate, but we also send it, tend to throw things at it um, and, and don't really have a, an overall uh, solution, uh, or do we know whether it will be solved? Now we're somewhat unique. We're, you know, obviously we're the largest insurance market in the world. We have a large variety of, uh, uh, of perspectives in our country. Um, ESG has become somewhat politicized. And from my perspective, we never really solve anything once it gets into that, that political uh, realm and, and becomes very difficult. We have, I think, 18 or 19 states that are suing um, on ESG because they feel that these there are some policies being put in place without um, without the benefit of uh, of uh, an elected official, if you will, having some oversight. But we are at the NEIC trying to focus on meaningful approaches that will assist in reducing carbon emissions and improving our overall climate, uh, or which will be meaningful approaches when we start to talk about race and diversity. Um, at, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I'm, I come from a state that is has lots of natural resources. Um, and, and so the needs for my state versus a state on the East Coast is completely different. We know that or we believe that improvements in how we manage our natural resource industry, um, preventing forest fires, uh, managing vegetation, those things will all help improve uh, carbon loading and improve uh, uh, you know, the climate in general. Um, and so we're focused on that. It's, um, uh, and even though the current administration has recently put out some additional uh, surcharges and benefits to those that have a, a heavier carbon footprint. Um, it's an interesting challenge as we in our country start to invest more in renewable energy sources. Many of those sources are expensive. Um, they, they quite don't pencil out and they are still very much dependent upon the oil and gas industry. And so it's, a, it's an interesting conflict when we start pushing towards electric vehicles, which still have a heavy carbon footprint to develop the vehicle. And we haven't figured out what we're gonna do with all the batteries uh, and how they're treated. Or when we start talking about wind energy, again, the same, the same problem. And we have an interesting thing here in Idaho where we have a great deal of hydro energy. Um, we produce, Hydro energy at about 32 cents a kilowatt hour, and by federal edict, we're having to sell off that hydro energy to buy wind energy, which is at 68 cents per kilowatt hour. And so our consumers are actually paying more in order to have 
have that benefit. Um, so it's it's a it's a work in in progress as we work through it. Um, it's certainly a work in progress as um, as we work with the industry and determine the appropriate role of the insurance industry. I agree with Petra that we need decent data to show that what we're doing actually is having a meaningful impact. Um, I think from the NAIC's perspective, we have steered away from uh, the, the greenwashing or steered away from the, the requirement of in, investing appropriately where we are seeing some pressure is from the reinsurance community uh, and perhaps from some of our insurers who are uh, not only selling in the U.S. but are selling in Europe and other places, and so we've we've got some uh, we've got some work to do. We've we've got some work to collaborate on, and and I I always look forward to uh, discussing things more with Petra and and Liam and others, and and discussing how we might collaborate uh, together. Thank, thank you for that response. It was uh, it, it, it was very um, enlightening, and I think that I'm very fair as far as the the pressures that come out of the United States. Being an American myself, and and being among um, you know all the political pressures that occur in the United States, and trying to figure out exactly how where that balance is. Um, you did uh, mention DE and I. Um, and so in, in some regions, we have uh, DNI. In the U.S., you hear more DE&I. Um, you, can you elaborate a little bit on what you were saying there? Well, if I can remember what I was saying. You're, you're, I, I think that we, we'll, and we'll get into this a little bit more, I think, as we, as we go through some of the other questions. But uh, we are uh, very much... Um, uh, looking forward and trying to make sure that products are available to everyone, regardless of the race, their ethnicity, their uh, identity, if you will. Uh, and we, uh, uh, we are looking at ways to eliminate barriers that are keeping those uh, products from being available to, um, in the marketplace. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we, we will uh, circle back with that. And before I go a little further, I did want to give Simon an opportunity to make comment on ESG specifically. Um, so what is your take from, uh, from Hong Kong, from Asia? What is the yeah. attitude towards ESG? And um, how is the, uh, um, the, the region maybe similar or different from Europe, the United States in your, in your point of view? Well, I mean, I, I, will, I will share my view on uh, Hong Kong. Uh, obviously, if we compare Hong Kong just as a city compared to, you know, Europe and also the uh, U.S., obviously, we, we are a very, very small city. But I think the, the little example that I'm going to share is really to do with listening to what Petra and also what Dean said. At the end of the day, we are now all trying to, you know, get on to this journey of moving forward. Now, there's so much diversity involved in, you know, your locality, your jurisdiction, even let even if politics are not in, is already a heck of a job. So uh, the, the way we are, the way I approach it and the way we try to approach it is we try to take the build of trying to be pragmatic, practical. We try to look at this whole job as a building block. So, and secondly, we try to do this with a view that we are part and parcel of the entire global community in contributing to this topic. We cannot wait for the others to do it before we do it. We also don't want to measure whether others are doing more or others are doing less versus what we're doing. So we come up with our own roadmap. Basically, you know, very much in line with Petra, what Petra already mentioned. I think the key theme is we look at disclosures, we look at reporting standards. We look at taxonomy. These are all clear. But one theme out of this is in whatever we do, we need to try to do our part in driving convergence, trying to support the international standard setting. And that's why, you know, we are subscribing to this uh, TCFD disclosure. 
We want to make it mandatory before 2025. We are also supporting this uh, IPSF, the International Platform on Sustainable Finance Working Group on Taxonomies, the ISSB, of course, on these uh, standards. These are all important because if everyone is trying to support this to, to start with and try to local adaptation, then we are actually moving closer. And the road, we always say the road, the journey to Rome, you know, there could be many pathways, but however, the alignment of the goal is important. Now, this is really the overall alignment. I think this is a core, kind of a, you know, it's a mindset that we need to embrace. Secondly, once we get to that, we get on to those really difficult area. So we need a common framework to monitor, to, to analyze the risks. And then Petra mentioned already data, you know, we have a lot of technical difficulties to analyze, you know, and also the scenario, the risk scenario, climate oriented stress scenario. So we must have this common framework. We are also involved in IAS. IAS obviously we will be supporting that in terms of, you know, trying to come up with, you know, climate, focused scenario analysis, looking at the asset side, the liability side, trying to address the data challenges. Ultimately, we can look at the differences between jurisdiction in one way. What we're trying to do in going for this uh, convergence is we are actually trying to move along between a lowest common denominator and a highest common factor. But however, if we try to move forward in the way that I described, which is actually supported, I think what Petra said already. Look at the building block, get it started, roadmap yourself, and then through the international organization, you know, organization like yourself, like the IAIS, like the other, you know, standard setting body, and then we compare notes, and I'm sure that we're putting pieces together to move forward. Thank you. That was um, very uh, articulate and particularly eloquent, I thought, in, in the way you've, uh, you've expressed your thoughts on that. Um, I, I'd really love to ask more questions specifically to the whole group about standards exactly, because as you mentioned, TCFD, and, and there are various movements throughout the world to try to get these standards together. And it it's... Um, as you said, a lowest common denominator heading to a, a common goal. So I, that was that was very um, eloquent. Thank you. Um, and actually, if I could uh, stay with you as we move on to the other topic of financial inclusion, and if I may, just you know, access to insurance is is certainly important to regulators. It's a main part of what it is that regulators seek to do, um, though everyone, I think, is inclined to think that it's all about solvency, but the access to insurance is also so essential. And I, I believe that financial inclusion is very highly connected to ESG, um, as, as Dean already mentioned, with um, diversity, equity, inclusion, but also uh, when you think about the, you know, the, the S, um, in ESG, I think that insurance really, among all industries out there, has an excellent story to tell that there is an inclusiveness that insurance can actually cause and is a good argument for um, insurers to be at the forefront of these discussions. And uh, Simon, if I could ask you, um, if you could, uh, you know, think about, um, you know, comment on what your perspectives are on this topic. Sure. I think uh, we all we all agree that in in, uh, in an inclusive market, all citizens should have access to appropriate and affordable insurance product. That's really the baseline. Now, every jurisdiction has its own uh, characteristics, and the so-called definition of underserved market need to be figured out by the regulator clearly. In the case of Hong Kong, I mean, it's a very developed market, but still. We have our own share of what is financial inclusion, uh, so to say, uh, drawbacks that we need to work on. So I think, I think the, this is one thing. So it is actually very important for the regulator to understand what are actually the underserved segments in the market. Now, in this sense, I want to highlight a couple of points for sharing and for discussions. Regulator, apart from prudential supervision, we certainly have 
And most of the regulator, like the IA also, we have a mandate to develop the market. And the financial inclusion actually point to a specific direction to look at inclusiveness. Now, in this respect, we are we need to, I'm, I'm, I strongly believe that we are not only trying to develop a certain product or a certain digital channel that will actually help to improve the access or the financial inclusiveness. What is needed is actually a balanced approach in terms of looking at what kind of product, what kind of needs, what kind of risks, and what kind of products, and also what kind of new risks arising therefrom. Because we are not only looking at the sustainability of these products to those underserved markets, we are also looking at the sustainability of the insurance company who are producing that kind of products. Example, increasing use of technology. I mean, we'll talk about cyber later. Even though it might increase the access to insurance, but it opened up so much risks that we also need to be able to address as a regulator. So if I look at this in perspective, then we have a two different, a very difficult task of balancing on the one hand, development of this inclusiveness, on the other hand, still playing our role as a potential, super, potential supervision uh, regulator. So I think this is, and out of this, and I will stop and I'll, uh, so that you know, other panelists can also come in. I look at very important uh, trilateral, three trilateral aspects of protection gap. That's basically what we talk about, financial inclusiveness, but in this area of underserved market segment, financial literacy and consumer protection. The three must go together. Without financial literacy being addressed properly, it will not result in needs, and therefore we have protection gaps. If the financial literacy are not addressed properly, it actually creates risks in consumer protection, which actually one of the conduct risks, no matter it's the insurance conduct, or no matter it's the intermediary's conduct that the regulator need to address. So ultimately, we need to look at these three very interrelated aspects of protection gap, financial literacy, and also consumer protection. Excellent, well said, thank you. Um, uh, Petra, do you have um, a comment on, on uh, the back of um, Simon's excellent introduction on the topic? Yes, thank you, Andrea. I fully agree, uh, Simon. That was an excellent introduction. And I, I like your focus on protection gaps, literacy, and, and conduct. I think you're touching on, on the same points that we are. And so I'm happy also that there's some convergence here. Um, I, I think if, if you look at financial inclusion, um, we are all aware that already uh, that is something to seriously consider also as supervisors and that's much related to literacy um, in, in, in a community uh, where uh, the simple fact that we're getting more digital, anything that has to do with reading, be it able to read, but also be it just having the sight and the ability to see uh, already excludes many people. And I think this is the major challenge, but then you can build further uh, impediments to actually understanding information or being able to read information uh, is essential. And, and, and in the complexity of some products, there's also the advice that you need to understand. So I think, uh, first of all, on the conduct side, uh, but also on the financial literacy side, it's, it's a matter of, on the one hand, educating, appealing, but on the other hand, providing information that is transparent, but at the same time is comprehensive. It's, it's not too much, it's clear. And that is a challenge because we do sometimes try to, to catch all in one document and that might not be a, a way to actually um, be able to reach every consumer. I do think intermediaries here will continue to have a very important role going forward. So as sometimes you hear that technology might replace the intermediate, I would say technology creates an even better if a bigger need for intermediaries to be there to, to support people making the right choices. Um, I think value for money is already an important topic, but it will remain 
very important going forward, particularly now that at least in Europe with the low for uh, the low yield for long, you have seen risks being pushed to consumers by the change of products. Yeah, less life is guaranteed, less pension on the basis of DB, but more DC and 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 more uh, unit link products. Now this again requires a lot from conduct supervision, uh, and but it definitely requires a focus on value for money. And finally, with the new technology, there will be new groups that could be excluded, and we need to be very conscious of that and preferably prevent that. And why is that? And that is that financial inclusion in the end, and I think the uh, the, the special advocate for the United Nations, uh, from the United Nations General for Financial Inclusion, Queen Maxima, her office uh, really developed a very nice concept about financial health. And financial health is literacy, but it's also being able to understand your current situation, being able to deal with shocks, a washing machine breaking down, lo loss of a job, and to have a fi confidence in your financial future. And here, I think the last two ones, being able to deal with shocks in your personal life and having confidence in the future, this is where insurance will play a key role in increasing financial health going forward. However, it has to do so in a time where the cost of living is increasing. So I think that in itself makes that we need to give a lot of attention to financial inclusion going forward. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's very um, uh, interesting, especially when you mention uh, Queen Maxima working in the micro insurance space. Um, there's the, she has an influence there as well. So in emerging markets, where all of this reaches, um, we're talking about the washing machine and, and um, any of the essentials that would affect a family. Um, all of that is uh, so incredible to have a, a really inclusion and paying attention to the customer and what the customer needs. And those needs change sometimes enabled by technology. So we have gig economy workers, Uber drivers that need coverage that didn't exist previously. And, and it's up to us to, to keep up with that and to innovate. Um, excuse me. Now, Dean, I had uh, already brought um, uh, some of your comments forward regarding um, equity and inclusion with DE&I. Um, being the topic, the uh, the phrase that we hear a lot um, used when talking about inclusion, um, when it comes to regulation and what we can do in order to help bring more coverage to those who need it, um, what is happening in the uh, NEIC along those lines? Uh, well, thank you for the question and and thank you for the opportunity to respond to it. And and I have to say, uh, from the from the onset, I thought both Liam and Petra's comments were very insightful uh, and very important. We at the NEIC and in our country are very passionate that everyone, regardless of the race, their ethnicity, their gender, their identity, that they should have access to life-changing insurance products. We know that we have personal experience, I have personal experience, where we know individuals are better off when they have life insurance coverage, when they have appropriate health coverage, when they have appropriate property casualty coverage. And so we've been working um, as in my year as president, we've been working on trying to identify the barriers that are keeping individuals from accessing uh, those that coverage, if you will. Um, we've spent a lot of time in also focused on uh, as mentioned previously on consumer education and awareness, we do agree completely that the use of agents and intermediaries are, are extremely important. Um, there is nothing like somebody of your own race, ethnicity, or gender explaining a very complicated product to you. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that, that there are opportunities for uh, all races, ethnicities to have access to the products, but also that they have access to the careers that come along with the insurance world. Um, and and we, we think there is tremendous opportunity there. Uh, so we, at the beginning of the year, um, announced uh, a, a creation of a foundation in which we will 
uh, allow and help folks be able to, to pursue different types of careers in the insurance world. In, in our, uh, in the US, we feel like we're always short on actuaries and examiners and, and now with technology, short on appropriate IT folks. And so if we feel like if we can help individuals uh, change their lives and have opportunities to these type of careers, that we're, we're all benefited, the industry is benefited and we as the regulatory community is, is, is benefited. We are looking at where the gaps of coverage are and trying to figure out how best, I know we had, uh, for example, we had a panel not long ago on, on Native Americans. Um, and we found out that they weren't buying coverage because the language we were using led them to a different perception. And so I, I think uh, it's great for us to have uh, improved consumer education, but I think we have to work very carefully to make sure that that consumer education is focused on that uh, individual ethnicity or, uh, or situation. And then lastly, um, I think it's important, at least to me, um, it's important for us to admit as a regulatory community, we can be a barrier. We can unintentionally cause people to cause coverage to be too expensive and therefore they can't access the products. And so I think there's a, there's a real balance, which uh, again, I'll go back to the, the theme of, of this conference seems to try and address this. Is there, a, is there an appropriate correlation between what we're requesting, what we're, we as the regulators are demanding, and the impact it's having on consumers? Excellent. And, and um, I know the IAIS has done guidance on, um, on, on helping with that as well, and pilots and um, all of that uh, um, to, to try to help give guidance to regulators internationally, because um, there's different challenges depending on the demographics, but um, as, as you mentioned, with uh, Native Americans, there are subgroups in in every country there that, that perhaps are have been overlooked by historical development of of how we've developed the rules, and um, certainly don't want to be a barrier to um, to the inclusion of people into having the financial protection that they need. Um, now. I'm going to ask you to switch gears pretty dramatically, um, and I'm going to stay with you, Dean, on, on the next topic, which would be on cyber. Um, now, cyber is something that is both a challenge and an opportunity, uh, as so many things seem to be, and there's so much knowledge and learning that, that has to occur, and um, it, you know, we want to benefit from technology, but at the same time, technology can bring more and more risks, more unknown risks, and, and regulators are in this position to try to make sure that the um, insurers are protected, the policyholders are protected, that information is being shared when there is a breach, um, despite how sensitive that may be for a company. So um, it can be something that is a, well, it has been a massive challenge and, and in the insurance community, there is um, fear about it, but some insurers have just dove right in and are specializing in cyber insurance. So, so from the um, point of view as an American um, regulatory body, uh, what do you think your, um, what do you think about the capacity in the market at this time relative to the need? Yeah, so it's an, it's a really interesting topic and a, um... A, a, a multi-headed dragon, if you will. I mean, um, the reality is cyber insurance is one aspect, uh, data collection and algorithmic um, biases is a whole nother aspect that we could spend an entire conference time just discussing and, and the NAIC certainly has. We, we've certainly tried to be out in front and center and collecting information on the U.S. cyber insurance marketplace um, and since we started. Uh, certainly cyber is, is one of those, as you said, uh, real opportunities, but it's a real challenge and a real threat. 
in my opinion. Con, you know, insurance is a consumer um, confidence product. And it's not like buying other products. There's, there has to be confidence that when the consumer gives you their private information, that that information is going to be held privately and that it's not going to be shared uh, or, uh, you know, either unintentionally or otherwise. So there's a, there's a real important role that we as regulators play in making sure that that consumer uh, data is, is uh, protected. And we've been uh, working on this um, uh, for some time, um, we believe that the cyber market here in the U.S. Um, is appropriate. Can, it certainly can be better. Uh, we believe that the companies are solvent. Um, we believe that they are charging uh, the appropriate uh, prices at this point in time. Um, the cyber insurance market went up by about 29% this last year, uh, roughly about $4.1 billion dollars. Um, so that pretty significantly, um, we've spent some uh, time this last at our national meeting earlier this month, where it, particularly on the property casualty market, uh, we were able to report uh, that that our the cyber market actually grew, the admitted market grew by 75%. Uh, the largest 15 companies, uh, right, nearly 75% of the market, though, Um and the admitted market has about $5 billion worth of premium here in the U.S. Uh, we expect um, the surplus market to pick up another $6 billion. So there's, there is a tremendous effort underway to make sure there's adequate coverage. But that's sort of helping on the back end. Um, I think at the same time, we are working on the front end to make sure that the information is, is protected to begin with uh, so that you might not need uh, quite the robust cyber insurance product. Um, we we want to make sure we just held our first ever uh, collaborative uh, forum in which we talked about algorithmic bias. And this kind of ties in to the, to the previous discussion, but you know, we're trying to make sure that the data that's collected is appropriate and that it is safe and, and that consumers have confidence that it's safe. So I'll stop there rather than ramble on. That's excellent. Um, Simon, what are your uh, thoughts on this topic? Okay. Uh, first of all, I feel that, you know, with the increasing uh, adoption of technology, we should look at technology and therefore cyber risks arising therefrom as a very, very serious topic because Technology is an enabler to a lot of what we see, including financial inclusion that we talk about. Right? If you want to have a better accessibility by digitalization, if you don't have the risks under control, very, very difficult. Now, if you look at the market, 2021 saw a very, very strong surge in ransomware event. 2021, very bad, uh, by actually increased by 148%. Most of the, uh, I think a, a lot of the uh, cyber insurer actually they lost money. As a result, that 2022 actually the premium increase uh, increased quite a lot. You know, I think 2021, I, I got some figures as in the increase by something like 80% last year and 20% this year. So this is a very, very strong adjustment. Also resulting, uh, resulting in the uh, change in the coverage, more restrictive, that is, but however, the key point is with increased pricing and also reduction in coverage that's actually linked to an increasing emphasis on the risk management, i.e. what the insurer need to put in as a prerequisite for the insurability. Now, this is important because the cyber market, look at it this way. It is, it is actually in an iteration of learning. You have big losses. You have more data, you have data points, you have therefore contraction in certain capacity and also coverage. And then it falls upon the stakeholder to say, look here, they need to improve on the cyber hygiene before they can be insured. And this will take in a new period of improved profitability as a result of price increase, better understanding of the core, the, the, the law scenario, the risks, and that will actually build up into a better cyber insurance market. 
I think 2021 definitely is a very important year because of the very serious losses due to ransomware. The adjustment lead to better situation in 2022 and also more vigorous uh, requirement on the risk management side, the cyber hygiene side. So with this, I feel that in terms of capacity in Asia, it's not a matter of their lacking capacity. It's actually how much the capacity costs. So if you have the right price, if you have the right risk management, the insurer are prepared to provide that kind of uh, capacity. So therefore, it all comes back to the point that cyber capacity is not only a matter of a product selling capacity or that. It's actually to do with selling to the stakeholder that you know they need to look at fundamental the risk, the cyber hygiene. A, a uh, respect for the risk and an ability to price it where the insurers belong. Um, so, uh, Petra, do you have um, anything to add to the subject? Yes, yeah, thank you, Andrea. Well, I think a lot of good things were already said. Uh, I think we see the same developments in the market. So we see uh, particularly ransomware events, but we see events and they're increasing. Uh, we see uh, demand for insurance increasing, and we see insurances provided uh, also increasing, but not at the speed that demand is increasing. I think that's one development we see. Um, moreover, what we see is that becoming more aware of the risk, uh, sometimes silent risk, can we call if 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 the policy itself that in, that the customer has taken is not clear and they can expect to be insured, are they, are they not? Well, the more this silent risk is being noticed and dealt with, we also see exclusions happening. And so uh, this is where we really clearly expect from the insurers that if they start to exclude certain types of risks in the sphere of cyber or so others, that they very uh, well explain this to the customer so they realize the change in their product. But I think uh, um, we need to be aware of, of, of that that exclusion is, is a way to deal with the risk, but of course it's, it's not a, way, a preferred way going forward. So thinking about how to also make sure that this risk is insured and that uh, the, the supply is meeting the demand better would be key. And here, and I think both Simon, but also Dean elaborates on that, you need the data, you need to understand what the risks are. So I think this will be an important part. I like what Dean said very much about the back end and the front end. And I think also here the insurance market can, can because they have so much experience and are, are often there when things go wrong, they, they can also have a role in advising how to how you can prevent or at least encouraging and getting that advice. And this could be really relevant for smaller entities or just consumers and, who, who don't have the, the big resources to, to get all the knowledge, but through a, a, a dedicated channel could still be better in formed and thereby ensure themselves they're better protected. So I think here is a role as well. Um, finally, maybe to, to just share that uh, with the DORA Act, the Digital Operational Resilience Act coming into place in Europe, we are getting better organized when it comes to data sharing related to cyber incidents, as well as to um, operational uh, resilience testing. And I think that's a very good step forward. Moreover, as supervisors, we will start to do oversight on the major cloud providers. Um, and what that does is, is, a, is that um, up until now, uh, we have to supervise through the license, but any insurer uh, that outsources, particularly IT uh, related and therefore cyber risk related activities, uh, that can be a chain of 11 entities, often ending up at one of these bigger cloud providers. And with the DORA Act and the oversight we now will implement, we will actually start also on the other end of the chain with the cloud providers uh, to look at the operational risks that are there thereby uh, making an effort to make our industry uh, even more resilient. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're at the end of our time, but I, you know, what I'm hearing is from, from all of you and from the comments you just had, Petra, um, is it really reflects how important the insurance industry is to contributing to economic growth, and to the, the evolution of society. And as all of these developments have been coming on, I think that uh, it is a, you know, a, a, a call to arms for the insurance industry, a rallying cry to, to really have us embrace what the changes are and how to prepare 
our various communities for preparing um, for uh, facing these various challenges, the very sophisticated ones and the very simple ones. Um, just as some uh, final conclusions, I guess, uh, Petra, since uh, you were the last one going, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on you. Do you have any um, final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you to you for organizing this and, and, and the moderation, but also thanks to uh, Dean and Simon. Um, just, just sitting here and listening to each other is already very helpful. I think it is a way forward. I think we're clearly dealing with the same issues, challenges. Um, we do have all, I think, this positive view uh, about the role of, of insurers in that um, and and in between there of course there's a lot to learn from each other and to better understand as well so i think this is helpful uh, and and i very much agree with the fact that insurers will have a a key role in 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 um, ensuring that we can deal with the risks because in the absence of the the need to think about risks people can thrive and economies can thrive and so uh, that's what we need to um to ensure in a way that is safe and stable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dean, uh, do you have any uh, final words you'd like to share? Yeah, just a, just a couple quick ones. And first of all, again, thank you. Um, always a pleasure to be on any panel with Petra and it's been good to get to know you a little more, Simon. I do agree with Petra, the more we have the opportunity to discuss some of these issues, uh, the, the better off we all are. I think it requires uh, understanding and flexibility. Not all jurisdictions are alike. The issues that Hong Kong may be facing may not be the same as what Idaho is facing. And so I think we have to be understanding of each other, but I do think there are common threads by, by which we learn from each other. Every time uh, I get to be on a panel with Petra, I learn something new, and, and so I'm grateful for that. I do think it's important for us to discuss and consider thoughtful approaches um, uh, so that we make sure that we are really hitting the target that we want to hit. Sometimes we, uh, government um, and the regulatory arm, can maybe overshoot our mark. And so I think at times it's appropriate for us as this, as this forum is about to sort of step back and, and ask, is this working? Is this the target that we were attempting to hit? And that goes along with something else that was said about uh, having clear uh, regulations. And, and in my mind, that means clear, more concise, um, less intrusive regulations. Um, allowing the market to grow, but at the same time protect the consumer. Um, we are so blessed to be able to regulate a market that is life-changing. It affects consumers. It affects the economy. It, as you said, Andrea, it, it, it really is impactful um, in our overall life. We can't borrow money. We can't start a business. We can't uh, protect our families. We can't do any of that without this product. So I think it's really important for us to be able to regulate it appropriately. And uh, Simon, you get the final word. Oh, no. Thank you very much, you know, Andrea. Great sharing. It's always, you know, wonderful to be hearing this uh, insight, uh, you know, from uh, panelists and especially, you know, Petra and also Dean on this topic. When I look at these topics you put together, Andreas, my goodness, you put ESG, financial inclusion, and you know, cyber, you just basically put all the daunting tasks that we need to cope with and hope to get something very solid within just 40 minutes. We can spend days talking about this and we need to. So we will try to do our best. Uh, I just want to perhaps share one thing I feel is very important as a regulator in managing this topic. Of course, we are always dealing with risks, but ultimately what is important is the word sustainability. Whatever we do, of course, need to embrace, understand the risks, but ultimately is to make sure that on the policyholder side or the prospect, when it comes to financial inclusion, we talk about the underserved segment, 
which to me is actually a target segment we want to work on. On the other hand, the insura. Both sides need to be sustainable. Otherwise, we won't have a solution that will last for long. So the regulator has a very, very difficult task in terms of understanding the risks which might, we might not understand a lot to start with. And we need to learn at the same time. And on the other hand, try to drive the commercial behavior into delivering a product that will fulfill our wish to address to the needs of the society, especially for those who need some help. But at the same time, doing something that is proper, so much so that you know, the consumer protection and also the necessary governance are being respected. Otherwise, we are not doing our job as a regulator. So I think the, uh, the sharing today, I find it very, very stimulating to me. Give me more food for thought in terms of, you know, asking how I have been doing this job and how I can do this job better. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Petra and also Dean, and also your moderation, Andrea. Thank you. And, um, you know, Simon, Petra, Dean, I'm uh, very uh, stimulated by what it is that, that, that all of you have brought to the table. Um, obviously, your experience, but clearly also your passion and wisdom, which are, um, which come through in your comments. And um, everyone's clearly handling the challenges ahead of them, but also really being thought about the solutions and um, that's very encouraging and exciting as a market participant. So really appreciate your thoughts and um, your insights on this. And I think that um, those who will be viewing this, uh, this commentary will be um, certainly encouraged by the, the words that you've had and, and the cooperation that is evident in the international insurance community. So um, thank you to all three of you. And thank you to the IAS for allowing us this forum. Well, that was a great conversation addressing ESG, financial inclusion, and cyber issues. You know, there were some takeaways from this that I think transcend all three topics. These include, one, these are difficult issues. There are no easy solutions or silver bullets. Markets are different. They often require different approaches, different solutions, and they all have different priorities and political and social dynamics. We can't ignore, but must work with this reality. Despite market variations, cooperation, coordination, convergence where possible is beneficial and desirable. Indeed, the question posed in the title of this panel, do regulatory priorities correlate is very apropos. All the panelists mentioned that regulatory dialogue is critical to addressing these issues, and they noted that today's panel discussion was the type of dialogue that they welcomed. Regulatory responses to these topics need to be balanced. They need to address solvency requirements, market conduct, but also the commercial realities of insurers. And finally, Insurance regulators, insurers, and indeed intermediaries need to have to step up and work together to meet market needs around these issues. Now, with regard to ESG, we heard that this is a broad, far-reaching topic. Much of the conversation to date has been around climate, but there are many other issues, biodiversity, financial inclusion, social issues that need to be addressed. ESG issues have been top of the regulatory agenda in the EU for some time, but in many other countries, they are now just being engaged and various market participants are in different stages um, of this journey. And this must be recognized. ESG issues, it was noted, are often politicized. This is unhelpful, but it is a reality and it must be considered in seeking. Um, solutions. Regulators must also be careful not to create excessive barriers to products and, and delivery of these products to the market. As Dean said, regulators can be a barrier. We need to acknowledge this. This candid assessment is critical. We also need to acknowledge that regulators and regulations can be a powerful enabling force. And the industry must 
cooperate with the regulators in order to achieve the best outcomes. Finally, with regard to ESG, there was an observation that data is critical. It's needed for measuring progress, for avoiding greenwashing, but the data must be of sufficient quality, comparability, and reliability. In discussing financial inclusion, it was noted that many parts of our societies do not have adequate access to insurance, and this has profound negative social and economic ramifications. Financial literacy is a key to improving financial inclusion. Simon referred to the critical correlation between protection gaps, financial literacy, and conduct for consumer protection. And as we become more digital, it was noted that we risk excluding more citizens from financial services. Regulators have a big role to play in helping to educate citizens on the role of insurance, how it can protect their lives and their livelihoods. But insurers must also focus on what consumers need and deliver the products in a clear um, manner um, and providing good value for money. In this discussion, I was also taken by the observation of the increasingly important role of intermediaries, rather than some of the commentary that is around the demise of intermediaries and disintermediation. It was noted that intermediaries provide an even more critical role right now in explaining risk exposure, risk mitigation tools, and how insurance fits uh, within this. With regards to cyber insurance, our panelists noted that this was a multi-headed dragon, which pre presents great challenges and great opportunities for the insurance sector. Attention must be provided to, provided to the front end and the back end, that is to data security, loss avoidance and mitigation on the front end, and recovery and loss protection on the back end. Regulators stated that their goals were to ensure sufficient cyber capacity, correct pricing, and appropriate coverages with appropriate exclusions. And of course, this topic highlights the tension that often exists between solvency regulation and adequate coverage and product availability for consumers. Many cyber books are loss making, and as a result, prices are going up and exclusions are proliferating. Consumers need to be educated on cyber risks and good cyber hygiene and the role that insurance can play. It was noted also that EU regulators have new authority to begin regulating cloud providers to the industry. In conclusion, this was a dynamic discussion among three extremely knowledgeable regulators from important global markets. We were fortunate that Petra, Simon, and Dean were willing to be so candid and clear in their comments. This panel was done at the terrific moderating by Andrew, and it provided great food for thought. Thank you, Petra, Simon, Dean, for your comments today. It was a great discussion.